the R3S Atoll represented a great step forward for air-to-air missile technology in the Soviet Union. Copied from a weapon designed for bomber interception, in certain tactical situations it conferred advantages of engagement range and single-shot lethality far above that possible with cannons. As an ambush weapon, it proved deadly in Southeast Asia. But as soon as the target and the firing aircraft began to manoeuvre, the Atoll quickly became less useful. Although upgraded models improved on the Sidewinder's 2G launching envelope, an alert enemy would likely be able to evade the missile either by turning to shield their emissions from its sensor or by forcing the attacker to exceed 2G or by forcing the missile seeker to hit its mechanical tracking limits once it was fired. Kill likelihood on trigger pull was in the region of 5% for Atoll. These problems were particularly significant for the MiG-19 and MiG-21 that made up the bulk of Warsaw Pact frontline squadrons. These were smaller and more agile than their western counterparts, but they lacked the avionics and weapons that would enable them to engage from beyond visual range or from the front quarter. A kill after the merge was their only offensive option, and that of course meant that both aircraft would be turning hard. In 1968, the Biznovat OKB was therefore directed by the Soviet Ministry of Aviation to produce a new missile with some unique characteristics. First, it would need a very short minimum engagement range, roughly duplicating the cannon engagement envelope. Within that envelope, it would need the potential to make very high G turns up to three times those of the evading aircraft. In order to make those turns, it would need low mass and thus inertia, and have a seeker head able to track at high speed and to a significant angle off the direction of travel. The missile needed to have small size and weight to enable a fighter to carry a number of weapons. This was a particular weakness of Soviet fighters, which only had the pylon space for two or four missiles of the Atoll class or larger. Finally, the weapon should take advantage of advances in seeker technology that would allow the missile to have more ability to be shot from outside of the ideal 6 o'clock low position. There was even potential that shots would be possible from above and thus against ground clutter. The initial concept, Project 62, was to base this weapon on the 9M31 missile used in the Strela-1 mobile air defence system. This missile is a 70-pound weapon with a small 5.7-pound warhead triggered by a radar fuse. Design drawings were completed in 1969 and production of 28 prototype rounds was started for completion in 1971. In terms of general arrangement, the R60 is actually rather different from the 9M31. Only the caliber and the warhead dimensions were retained from that weapon. It employs a canard layout with cruciform fins and rudders. The additional fixed canards ahead of the main rudders are destabilizers that improve their efficiency at high angles of attack. Although simple structures, these represent a signature innovation in the design. The R60 is built in five sections. At the front is the Komar or Mosquito IR seeker head. The destabilizers are attached to the missile body on this section. The Komar, or OGS-60TI to give it its proper name, was developed by Arsenal PA under Chief Designer SP Alexienko. Unlike other advanced ion missiles of this generation, it uses an uncooled photocell and a low inertial gyrostabilizer. The detection cone was 12 degrees off the long axis of the missile, an improvement over the 8 degrees that the R-13 was capable of. The development of the Seeker was started by Arsenal PA in 1968, with serial production started by Progress Research and Production Company in Kyiv. The sensor was mounted on a gimbal that could track a target moving up to 35 degrees per second across the field of view, and up to 45 degrees off the long axis of the missile. That allowed the launching aircraft to be pulling upwards of 5G, potentially as high as 7G at the point of firing. In testing, it apparently hit targets pulling 8G, which was outside the capabilities of all US aircraft of the period. Immediately aft is the 3 kilogram continuous rod warhead, the rod element of which is made of an alloy of zirconium, molybdenum, and tungsten. 
The small size of the warhead made it most effective when penetrating the structure of a target aircraft rather than exploding in proximity. Then come the rudders, the actuators for which are powered by gases bled from the rocket motor, the flight control system and the contact detonator for the warhead. The fourth section houses the proximity fuse and the turbo generators that convert exhaust gas into the electrical power for rudder control and powering the missile's other electrical systems. Two fuse options were available. The pre-production models and some production models had the swift optical fuse that functions much the same as that in the Atoll. Eight windows are located around the circumference of the missile body in opposite pairs. Inside is an optical emitter and receiver lens is pointed forward 75 degrees to the direction of flight. The fuse detonates the warhead when the missile comes into a cone between 3 and 16 feet from the target. The alternative fuse, which the majority of aphids were equipped with, was called Calibri and was a radar proximity type that uses flush antennas to sense the target and detonate the warhead. Conceptually, this would allow a pilot to volley fire a pair of weapons and thus nullify optical or radar countermeasures employed by the target. Perhaps the designers were worried about active laser systems being installed on tactical aircraft. If it missed, then the missile would self-destruct after 25 seconds. Aft of the fuse is the motor. It is a high-impulse solid fuel unit with a burn time between 3 and 5 seconds. At terminal velocity, the missile reached Mach 2.5 plus the velocity of the launching aircraft, 50% faster than the Atoll. The fixed rear trapezoidal fins are on the missile body in this section, equipped with rollerons to stabilise the missile in flight. The aphid very much lived up to its name, being only 6 feet 10 inches, or 2.1 metres long, versus 11 feet 2 inches for the Atoll. It was also based on a 4 and 2 thirds inch diameter missile body rather than the Atoll's 5 inch. At launch it weighed 95 pounds, half that of the advanced R-13M. It was structurally very strong, capable of pulling up to 47 G. The compromise for this diminutive size was range. The aphid's effective range was between 250 meters and a kilometer. The R-13M could reach out as far as 4 kilometers, but it had a minimum range of 900 meters, so you can see what the designers were going for. The first test rounds were fired from a ground launcher at a tracer tower on the ground. With this phase successfully concluded, a MiG-21 SMT test aircraft fired six rounds at the tower and at parachute flares. Four MiG-23Ms then joined the program. Alongside the MiG-21, they fired against MiG-17 and LA-17 drones. 60 rounds were fired in this phase, 17 in 1971 and 43 in 1972. A further 50 rounds were fired in state acceptance trials in 1973 for a total of 166 articles expended in the program. Although only 7 of the first 43 missiles hit their targets, probability of kill was calculated at 50% if one missile was fired and 70-80% to if two missiles were volley fired. Having satisfied the Ministry, production was ordered on December 18, 1973 under the designation R-60. Serial production was carried out from 1974 to 1991 at the Tbilisi Aviation Plant, the Ivskovs Mechanical Plant and the Communarm Plant in Moscow. 30,000 rounds would be made, with peak production being about 6,000 missiles a year. R-60 was initially deployed on the MiG-21 BIS and MiG-23M tactical fighters, and could also be carried by the MiG-25 and Su-15 interceptors. It was eventually integrated onto every strike and fighter bomber in the inventory and the Mi-21 Hind helicopter gunship. Pylons were available for single, double and eventually triple carriage of the missiles, substantially increasing magazine depth. Development of an improved R-60M began in 1973 and was completed in 1974. This was a refined version of the concept rather than something radically different. The warhead was upgraded with the rods now made with a depleted uranium core. These were actually mildly radioactive, so if you get up close you can tell an M from the basic R-60 by the small radiation symbol on the second section of the missile body, which you can see here. An improved, cooled Komar-M sensor was fitted with a 20-degree detection cone. 
This sensor was also designed to offer a limited all-aspect capability, albeit from very short ranges. A pilot would have to be able to get a lock on and fire the weapon between 2 kilometers, where the sensor was effective and the minimum range of 300 meters, a matter of seconds in a dogfight. These upgrades required more space, so the missile body was lengthened around the rudders by about 2 inches to accommodate the new continuous rod warhead. Launch weight went up £3 to 99 There was a specific version of this weapon for the MiG-25 featuring a protective cap over the seeker head to protect it from overheating in the high-speed airflow. Aside from that, the two missiles were interchangeable on the launch rail, as you'd expect from an IR missile. Those Soviet fighters equipped with an infrared search and track system could slave the aphid to that sensor to improve lock-on speed, particularly off the bore site. How useful this would be in anything except an ambush situation is debatable, though. With so many rounds produced and because of the proliferation of platforms that could fire it, the AFID has seen sporadic action down the years. The first recorded active use of AFID outside of testing was on the 20th of April 1978. The crew of Korean Airlines Flight 902, a Boeing 707, travelling from Paris to Anchorage, made a navigational error and flew into Soviet airspace near the Kola Peninsula. A Su-15 piloted by Alexander Bosov was directed to intercept. Although apparently reluctant to fire on what was obviously an airliner, Bosov eventually did so and launched two aphids from close range at 30,000 feet of altitude. The first missed, the second hit the left wing and knocked four metres off it. One passenger was killed immediately from shrapnel wounds and a second died from his injuries before the plane was able to make an emergency landing, an hour and 40 minutes after the missile hit. The first kill with an aphid was on the 21st of June 1978. Four Iranian CH-47 Chinook helicopters strayed over the Soviet border and were intercepted. MiG-23M aircraft captain Valery Skinder of the 152nd Fighter Aviation Regiment, based in Turkmenistan, hit one CH-47 with two R-60s. It crashed and the crew were killed. He followed up with his cannon, hitting the second Chinook. Its crew managed to land and they were captured by Soviet border guards. Syria used the R-60 as its standard air-to-air -air missile in 1982, claiming a reasonably well-evidenced kill on a Kfir. On the 9th of June 1982, during an air battle over Lebanon, Captain Ronan Shapira shot down a MiG-21 in an F-15, but was himself hit by an R-60 in the nozzle of his right engine. The affected engine failed immediately, but the left one, although it was damaged, continued to work, and the plane caught fire. Shapira was able to fly the F-15 20 minutes back to Israel and landed at Rabat David. On the ground, it turned out that a square metre sized hole had been blasted in the nozzle of the right engine, and the vertical and horizontal stabilisers had about 400 fragmentation holes. The plane was, however, repaired and returned to service after two months. Although details are sparse, an Iraqi MiG 23 ML was able to down an Iranian F 14 with an R 60M on the August the 11th, 1984. Quite how this occurred is a bit of a mystery to me, as the Iranians tended to use their F-14s in a quarterback role. Obviously something went wrong tactically, as apparently the R-60 was fired from the rear quarter and went right up the Tomcat's tailpipe. There were a number of unsuccessful firings in the following two decades. During the Angolan Civil War, a pair of Cuban MiG-23s surprised a flight of Mirage F-1s. Multiple R-13s and R-60s were fired, and it seems that one of the latter detonated near a Mirage, damaging its tailpipe. This aircraft crashed while attempting to land. Probably the last kill made with an AFID was on December 23, 2002, when an Iraqi MiG-25 shot down a Predator drone. For the most part, it is now out of frontline service, although it is possible that R-60s have been used in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Arsenal in Kyiv developed an all-aspect seeker for the missile in 1997, but it's not clear whether it was implemented or whether Su-24s and Su-25s have carried the missiles for self-defence. All in all, the AFID seems like an impressive upgrade on the underwhelming ATOL, but the statistics don't tell the whole story. 
The issue with AFID is doctrinal, and its effectiveness has been severely limited by the capabilities of the aircraft that carried it. During the 1960s, Soviet air superiority fighters were split into two types. The MiG-21 was the day fighter, designed for point defence not far from the airfield. It was therefore relatively small and manoeuvrable, particularly at high altitudes. It was initially armed with cannons, then atolls, and eventually both. All-weather interceptors were much larger aircraft intended to patrol over long distances carrying very large, long-range, bomber-killing missiles. The MiG-25 was also extremely fast, even when not going to engine-shredding Mach 3 range speeds. Strike aircraft were a different breed again. The US and eventually most NATO air arms went a different way. Their default choice for almost every mission in the early to middle 1970s was the multi-role F-4 Phantom. Designed as a bomber interceptor for the Navy, the Phantom was a brilliant design that majored on raw power and carrying capacity. Its air-to-air weapon system incorporated both long- and short-range missiles, and eventually also an internal gun in the E model. Once in a dogfight, the Phantom was largely an energy fighter, the pilot of which would seek to win using vertical manoeuvres and by controlling engagement distance. He would seek to box in the less powerful MiG so it could be killed by a missile shot once its manoeuvring energy had been expended. A fishbed pilot's best hope in a dogfight was to keep the fight in close but this was where his weapons would be least effective. Reading transcripts of Arab experiences against Israel shows just how frustrated they were with the Atoll, which had a narrow launch window and was unreliable to boot. The AFID was therefore a fantastic addition to the MiG-21 as a weapon system. Small size meant that six missiles could be carried rather than four. To effect this, the new APU-62 rail was a T-section structure that carried one missile in the traditional fashion, and the other ventrally. And of course, the AFID itself promised to be more effective in tracking and hitting targets. The trouble as I see it was that the Soviet planners had decided on a doctrinal change for their next generation of fighters, but had seemingly failed to inform the missile designers. Compartmentalization was a perpetual problem with the secretive Soviet military-industrial complex. The MiG-21's successor, the MiG-23, was designed for very high speed and acceleration rather than turning ability. In ways, it was taking lessons from the Phantom and applying them to Soviet fighters. To that end, it featured an air search and interception radar as standard, and the Apex semi-active homing missile as its primary armament. The Flogger lacked even the dogfight maneuverability of the Phantom, and therefore was unlikely to get into a position to employ the AFID, which remained a rear-aspect homing missile even in advanced M guys. Worse still, it couldn't carry ATOLs on the wing-glove pylons because of gas ingestion issues, so the AFID was essentially the default weapon unless the flogger wasn't carrying apexes. The tactical problems with the AFID became more acute when the F-14, 15 and 16 emerged. Whereas there was some chance of a flogger pilot getting a bead on a Phantom in a close-quarters fight within the AFID's envelope, there was essentially zero chance of that being possible against the new Team Series aircraft. These fighters were armed with the AIM-9G and the All Aspect 9 Lima. Both missiles offered greater range than AFID by a factor of three or more and easily enough maneuverability to catch a flogger. The minimum range issue just wasn't an issue as these aircraft had M61 Vulcan cannons as a backup. AFID was therefore seeking to take advantage of tactical flaws in US fighters that ceased to exist just as it was entering service. The issue with firing it from a Foxbat or Foxhound was more sensor-related, although a combination of high speed and altitude made them more difficult targets for US fighters, that capability also made them poor platforms for deploying a missile that had a rear aspect detection range of a couple of kilometres and a front quarter lock-on range measured in hundreds of metres. It's hard to see how the AFID would have been an effective weapon on these platforms. To cap it all, aside from restricted range and sensor performance, Combat and equivalent combat firings of the AFID demonstrate the problem of the small warhead, which was generally insufficient for a single round to cause a killing hit. It couldn't even drop a defenseless airliner. Fully half of the aircraft hit by AFIDs managed to make it back to a runway. For this reason, as the new MiG-29 and Su-27 began to enter service in the mid-1980s, they brought with them the R-73. Compatible with the AFID, they would have likely carried it in the event of a conflict with NATO in the 1980s, 
but only once stocks of more advanced missiles had been expended. In summary, then, the AFID was the right missile at the wrong time. Its innovations in terms of control surfaces and sensor mobility would go on to be influential in the design of subsequent Soviet missiles. Its sensor performance, high speed and greatly widened envelope are on paper advantages over the R-13. But in the real world, the compromises of light weight on range and warhead size made it the wrong weapon for the flogger with which to fight Western fighters. It may have made attack pilots feel like they could defend themselves without compromising on the amount of air-to-ground ordnance they could carry, but for resting control of the air, it was a shuffle, not a step, in the right direction.